Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. My name is Rick Shreves. I'm the president of DCF, which is the Decentralized Cooperation Foundation. We are the foundation that's associated with the Agoric ecosystem. We support the ecosystem development with grants, with bounties. So take note of that. There is money available to build, and we're excited about what's happening with orchestration in particular. And we also support the ecosystem with various other activities, including delegation, staking, and various activities, such as this one here. And thank you all for coming. I know that at these events, there's a lot of things competing for your attention. So I really appreciate you taking the time out to come here and attend this. And hopefully, you're going to be excited about what you hear. Before we jump into it full-fledged, I think you know the title of this talk makes some assumptions. Number one, that everybody's on the same page about what chain abstraction means. And number two, as the title implies, that somehow we need to unify Web3, that it's falling <laughs> short right now. So I'm going to start by asking Dean and if you would be so kind, uh, talk to us about chain abstraction and this concept of orchestration and how these things relate to each other. Sure, yeah. So chain abstraction, it's you know an important industry narrative. At its simplest, it is users want to use Web3 assets and services without caring about the underlying infrastructure. They don't care about the underlying chain. You know, same with you know my analogy is DoorDash. When I order a when I order a hamburger, I want it delivered hot. Uh, and I don't care whether DoorDash is running on Amazon or Google. Same thing for crypto assets. And, and the most important thing out of that is users want something from us, right? There are lots and lots of users out there we haven't reached yet. And, and so chain abstraction is the realization that, yep, we got to deliver that to them in a way that they don't have to care about all the details of, our, of these various different technologies and tribes. And I'm just going to open this up to the group. I'm not going to call on you guys individually, so let's just jump in and have a conversation about this. Wh why is it that Web3 is not unified today, or, or where does it fall short? Where is there an opportunity to make it more unified? Yeah, I guess I can kind of start here. Um, I think maybe oh, what I'd like to do is kind of start with some contextualization as to kind of where we're moving in the industry in terms of scaling. So very recently, you've kind of had this big popularization of the modular thesis and kind of this approach of scaling where we actually kind of create app chains. So we move applications off of monolithic chains to their own chains, so app chains. This introduces a lot of fragmentation. So we've had fragmentation forever between monolithic chains, but it's been less of a problem because if you have multiple monolithic chains that are competing to be the one chain that users use, then this issue of fragmentation is a little bit less uh, immediately apparent. But because we're kind of taking this modular approach of scaling, and as an industry, we're producing thousands of change, thousands of rollups, then this fragmentation problem becomes really crucial to fix. Because if we don't fix it, then the user experience is just, uh, it's, it's terrible. It's not going to be very, uh, you know, it's not suitable for any sort of consumer adoption. So this is where this lack of unification comes in. Because, for example, if I want to use app chain A and I deposit 100 USDT, then I want to go and use app chain B because I want to use a different application. I have to go find a bridge. Sometimes there's not bridges available. If there is, and they can be expensive, they can be slow. This is a pretty terrible user experience. And not only beyond this, I need to actually cognitively manage multiple balances across these chains. So this is like, we're asking a lot from users. And this is a big part of the reason why we haven't seen a lot of adoption today. And so this is where this kind of lack of unification comes in. And this is where this whole idea of chain abstraction kind of pops up to solve this problem. Yeah, I think these guys covered really well that the user experience is fraught with challenges in this kind of ever chain Let's expanding just world. Let's just say it, it's shit, okay? <laughs> it's, it's shit, it is. Uh, I also want to point out though that the developer experience is worsening at a pretty dramatic rate as well. I mean, think about the choices you have to make now as like, hey, I've got this idea to create this user experience. Okay, which chain or layer two or layer three or whatever do I pick? Where do I store this state? You know, how do I, if I want to interoperate with multiple chains, what are my choices? And it's also extremely fragmented. And I think that there's room for improvement both on the user experience side and the developer experience experience side, which should all come together and hopefully make it a, a more sane environment. I feel like there also hasn't been much of a care for it, right? And I think you haven't seen a lot of innovation on the application side. And like, you even look at the top 100 on CoinMarketCap, I think there's maybe three applications. The incentive isn't there for applications because you're also extremely limited by wallets and by onboarding and by friction where it's... Right now, if I want to use a product, my total addressable market is effectively that of MetaMask, right? And you're really kind of capped at that. And I think there's such a large world where you run into this chicken and egg situation of products can't exist because there's no users, and users can't exist because there's no products. And I think chain abstraction um, in its kind of entirety is kind of the, the catalyst point for changing that. Uh, the the thing that I mentioned about the, cool, the one of the most important things about chain abstraction is users want 
this thing, right? We want users to want stuff. The other side of that is the thing you're pointing out is part of the reason it's an important narrative for this next cycle is the crypto environment, the crypto community is starting to realize that they actually need to deliver products to users that users want to use, right? And those two come together to now how do we have developer, ex developer experience that enables them to build that, which turns out to be, you know, delivering simple solutions is hard. And we need the tools and services and, you know, orchestration, chain, chain um, uh, uh, so signatures, words for it. all these things, yeah. Yeah, and that, and that raises a point I want to dig in a little deeper on. So, you know, we're, we've accepted the, the thesis that we live in a multi-chain world. We've all given up on the whole idea that there's one chain to rule them all. That died a long time ago. Given that, what trends are we seeing in software development that reflect the need for chain abstraction and orchestration? How are we seeing the developer community respond to the challenge that we've created by building this multi-chain world? I think there's a big focus on like orchestration layers, liquidity layers, ag layers, basically uh, the reunification of different, like I think there's kind of a focus on what are the parts of the experience that we really need to reunify. I think liquidity is probably the one that has the most traction in, ad in addition to accounts, right? There's a lot of products for account abstraction, particle, like and others are building some really great solutions there. And so I, I think that's what I've been excited about is like probably there are too many solutions like to solve the problem. It's kind of that joke of like, we have 14 standards. We need one more standard to unify them all. Now there's 15 standards. Um, but I, I do think that we're starting to see people like pick off some bite-sized chunks that are important and that we can kind of tackle more deliberately. Yeah, it definitely uh, is reminiscent of uh, like 20, 2020, 2019 of Cosmos kind of dealing with this problem, which is saying, hey, we want to you know, be in, instead of being modularity, it was the app chain thesis. And then you saw IBC and interchain accounts uh, kind of start to form off of that. So from a technical perspective, I do actually think we're kind of seeing a revitalization or kind of even like a remake or, or, or a review of that. Um, but I do think that it's becoming not Uniswap forks, which if I were to probably look at like products in this industry, it's probably about 99% Uniswap forks. And then so now saying, and, and then for, for good example, right, because the product market fit of the majority of this industry is airdrop farming. You know, and we can't really deny that, hey, let's make it easier to transfer to swap on one L2 because I'm going to get this airdrop. And once that airdrop comes, I'm going to go to another L2 with the money that I made. And then so on and so forth and so on, right? And so it's like, we're going to realize similarly to 2020, that that only lasts for so long and then everything's going to die and then no one's going to care about crypto and we're going to be back here in three years having the same conversation. Yeah, I guess like to take a sort of broader perspective on the impacts to developer experience and kind of developer products that will come from chain abstraction is that I think, uh, first of all, it's important to establish something that we actually produced an article with Agoric about like two or three weeks ago, which is the layers of chain abstraction. So at least the way that we classify it at Particle the chain abstraction really is a quite collaborative environment. Um, and actually, my keynote uh, later is all about this, where it's like chain abstraction can sort of be, uh, you know, uh, categorized in three layers. So you have like things like the blockchain level, the uh, application level, and the account level. I think for developers, the application level is going to be really important. So this is things like orchestration, for example, where developers can actually programmatically orchestrate cross-chain transactions. And I think what's really interesting is that we're going to start seeing applications that start to exceed the confines of any single chain and be intrinsically chain agnostic. And I think this is going to create a few different things. First of all, now that users can use these applications from any chain, and that there isn't barriers because of the single ecosystem that they were previously confined to, this is going to change the way that applications compete with one another. Because no longer am I, as an application developer, competing with only those within my ecosystem, but rather kind of users as a whole are now this kind of uh, an entire commodity, universal commodity that spans the entire ecosystem rather than you know, like specific chains that are like, oh, we have X amount of users, there's like these applications, I'm competing with three other DeFi protocols in this ecosystem. It actually becomes a much more sort of like free market type within the entire Web3 ecosystem as a whole. And I think this has a lot of interesting implications for how developers are going to be building products and the way that they're going to be kind of uh, getting users and getting liquidity. I think it's going to change the whole dynamic in the space. Totally. And it's going to put a lot of pressure on people to build things that are competitive from a user perspective, yeah. right? So as we open up this Pandora's box, right, and we provide more interoperability between chains, how do we address the security and scalability issues? I'll start with IBC, right? You know, there, there's a lot of different interop protocols. There's a lot of bridging protocols and so forth. IBC is something that... that came out of the Cosmos ecosystem, came out of the interchain ecosystem, but it was really focused at going beyond that. And it's one of those things where you're not just trusting a, a, a you know, 
at, at the crypto level, you're not trusting a multi-sig, you're not trusting one entity, you're not trusting one organization. Instead, two chains can build a bridge permissionlessly where they're verifying the, the, the connection to the other chains. And that's just a big step up in, in accessibility and performance and so forth. And you have, in fact, uh, yeah, we got, the, the, the timing of these logos has been amazing. <laughs> Union is With doing uh, uh, bridging uh, across to ETH, but you know, so, I, so IBC connects Cosmos chains, there are people working on getting it over to, um, uh, to, to Ethereum, people working on getting it over to all these other ecosystems so that you can easily do cross-chain activity where my characterization of, of interop inside of the interchain ecosystem is, you know, they will do things of, you know, oh, this asset on one chain got used by a service on that other chain that would be hugely celebrated in many other parts of the ecosystem. And in the IBC and the interchain, that's just Thursday, right? That's just, I rolled out a new chain and of course I listed it on Osmosis and, and set up a loan thing on UMI and got it on Astro report and, and did all the and bridged it over to ETH with Axelar or Union or Hyperlane or whatever, right? Those are just what you do in a connected world. And um, and and we're we've gotten a long way in that connected world and, and done so in a way that is robust and safe. More thoughts on security and scalability, gentlemen? I think that uh, one of the biggest criticisms we hear about chain abstraction is that if you abstract away the chain entirely, then users may not be able to reason about security principles. Um, I do think that this, like, the intention of this argument is good, but I think in practice, it's probably going to look a little bit like on Web2, where people do actually still have some concept of, like, the, reputa the security reputation of even some pretty basic infrastructure. They may not even be aware they're using it, and it might not come to a head until something bad happens. But, I, I mean, I expect it'll work out pretty similarly, where, like, developers are going to care about security on behalf of their users, because if their users end up getting hacked or having some kind of terrible experience, that's going to reflect poorly on them for making that decision. So I, I, I think that, and I also don't, I don't know that we believe that like hiding the chain you're using entirely is always going to be the right choice. I think in most cases, probably that'll still be apparent. It's just about like kind of simplifying and streamlining the experience of either using one chain or using many chains or using multi-chain applications. Yeah, and to take that even further, right, like I think there's, there's going to be bounds of where this conversation goes from, right? We could talk even on the login perspective example, right? Like, and I, we went into this a lot because we, you know, of course, and I assume everyone here works with social and, uh, you know, and Apple and things like that, but if any of those get compromised or anything like that, you get a JWT that gets compromised. And, you know, I think you're going to see a lot more investment on kind of ZK proving, which is slow. Right, and then you're going to then have this again, this de you know, this this decentralization pyramid of, you know, what are we what are we selecting here? Security, um, speed, or decentralization? Um, and as we get further and further into traditional consumers, they're probably unfortunately not going to care. And I think it's going to be really interesting when we're all sitting here having the conversation of like where are these trade-offs happening in that uh, environment. I think this is actually a, an interesting conversation. We had um, kind of a, a quick conversation about this with a live stream that we did with the roll-up recently, if anybody knows them. It was us, Connects to Cross, and a few other guys. And this question came up of like security in a chain abstracted world. And I think like really the main thing, and I think it was Connects that made this point that I really liked, was that um, the trust assumptions are just being more so put on developers. I mean, there's already trust assumptions whenever you're using applications. It just now, if you kind of abstract away the chain, it's up to the developer to choose a chain that's secure and kind of make those uh, decisions for the user. Then, of course, you know, you can display the chain in some cases and, like, you can show this. But I think, ultimately, it doesn't change dynamic much more than what it already is today. Um, so I think people tend to overblow the uh, security assumptions that might kind of, uh, you know, uh, the, the security uh, like impacts that chain abstraction will have to the ecosystem. I think it'll, it'll be neutral or actually even positive because, for example, in like intent uh, architectures and one other thing that I think also Connect said is that like you have this dynamic where solvers are economically incentivized to make more secure decisions for users whenever you're doing sequences of transactions. So I think there's a lot of things at play for chain abstraction that actually might improve security um, rather than detriment it at all. Yeah, to me, a very important thing is abstracting does not necessarily mean hiding, right? Separation of concerns does not mean you then sweep a concern under the rug, right? In, in, the, in the traditional financial world, I care about my counterparties, right? I might care about whether I'm doing business with Silicon Valley Bank in one particular week in May versus a couple months, a couple months earlier, 
but did I really pay attention to whether the rails they were using were ACH or Swift? Right? That was below my resolution. That was abstracted away from me, but there's certainly people out there that will care for their business purposes. And so one of the things we want out of these chain abstractions is indeed not hiding, but simplifying. Once I've decided to stake on that network, the details of the particular transport I've already decided I'm going to do, and I don't, I, I don't want to have to then sign three different transactions that I don't really understand in order to make that happen. Um, the other thing I will mention, because there were logos flying by, was Polymer's logo. Also, you'll see here, they have IBC Austin tomorrow, which when, if we want to talk more about the interop, you know, go to that. Anyway. So I've been given the, the, I've been given the five minute warning here. So last couple of questions on this. We touched on the implications this is going to have for apps having to compete with each other in this new world, right? What are the other economic implications that we need to be thinking about, both for developers and for institutions? We've got all these different systems that are paid for with different tokens. Mechanically, we have, we, you know, we've got, and, and we don't want to inflict any of that on users, let alone, you know, even the first gas cost. You know, I observe that in the uh, various app stores of, of iPhone and, and Google, almost all apps are free but with in-app purchases. But they aren't pay up, you know, they, they aren't pay up front, and all the popular ones are. And so making that interaction, again, back to users where we're not inflicting all of these trivial decisions that are not about what they want to accomplish. I don't have to think about that when I order a hamburger. I don't want to have to think about it when I order steak tea. Right. Anyone else? Any other comments on that? Yeah, I guess I think when it comes to economic changes for developers and for users and for institutions and stuff like this, um, one of the big things is almost kind of a little bit of rehashing what I said a moment ago, which is this kind of you know now dynamic where liquidity is a completely different resource than it is today because currently liquidity is siloed within certain ecosystems, and when users can move liquidity to, to, to new applications and to new chains without really realizing that they're moving liquidity in some cases, this changes uh, value capture for applications, for institutions significantly because now no longer do we have to convince users to onboard to my chain or deposit funds on my chain um, or bridge to my chain. Uh, instead, it's just start using this application. And if you already have funds anywhere else, then it'll now be within this application, which changes a lot in terms of the economics and how we capture value, how we kind of onboard users. And I think this is going to, uh, I don't know exactly what this will change in terms of how we build applications and like the specific dynamics this will kind of pose in the future. But I think it pr presents a very interesting scenario for what like the ecosystem will look like, you know, in even six to 12 months time. Yeah, I think off of that, um, like a very, just get very specific about one aspect is uh, we've dealt with this a lot as an L1 where basically the cost of capital on a newer chain is extremely high because there's usually a lot of friction to get capital from other chains or w just the real world into your chain. Uh, and I think one of the benefits of chain abstraction is like by dramatically removing this friction, we should actually see downward pressure on uh, the, the cost of capital on different chains. So you should see like, the premium on swaps, like if you were to trade for ETH on uh, near back in the day, it would have been quite expensive. There would have been premium over trading on ETH itself because people had to move that capital over and there was opportunity costs and all these different things. And I think with chain abstraction, we can, and some of the products that are built, particularly on like the liquidity side, uh, we can actually see this come down pretty dramatically and, and normalize. It should get a lot closer to like centralized exchange pricing and like true price discovery should happen, I think, in, in broader areas. Yeah, and I think even more, and we, we've kind of touched on this enough where I think there's kind of two conversations being had. There is this friction side, and then there's this, uh, you know, informational side, which is, you know, if I'm a regular user and I want to use a product, I don't know what the hell Solana is. I don't, you know, I, mean, I shouldn't have to do this research. Um, you know, by the time I'm done doing the research, the thing that I wanted to buy is now two times more expensive or it's at zero, right? And so I do think that there is this kind of this new level of, you know, why are we still using these tokens as a denomination? Like, people are used to, you know, whether it be dollars or whatever their native currency is. And I think there's this extra level of, you know, I call it like informational friction of what's a wallet, what's a this, what's a that. Um, you know, and I think when we talk about the economics of that, I think, you know, there's obviously going to be, you know, and I think a big, big part of crypto is like the hardest thing in the world to get is an American bank account. And now allowing a global, you know, uh, effectively allowing a global audience to participate in what would be a global marketplace without really having to go through this insane amount of user knowledge is, I think, this kind of next step of abstraction that needs to happen. I love it. I love it. And I do hope that is the future. Uh, I've been told we are done. So I want to thank you all for your time. If you could give a hand to our panelists, please. I appreciate it, guys. Some interesting thoughts came out of that. I wish we could talk some more. Have a great day, everybody. Enjoy consensus, everyone. And thanks again for coming.